Okay, moving on to the next section, one-sided limits and continuity. Again, this is a limit thing that you saw last year. Uh, with most limits, uh, I think you saw it last year. I hope you saw it last year. Okay, with most, li most, with most limits, um, if you have like the limit of, as x approaches c, of f of x, um, this thing, if it doesn't specify, if it only says x approaches c, that means you're looking at both sides. Um, now, there is notation if you only want to look at one side, and that is that if you put the little exponent looking thing as a superscript, is technically, technically what it's called. But if it's C with that little plus sign, that means you look at the right side. If it's the number with the, okay, uh, oh, I forgot white, okay. If it's a number with that negative sign, then you're looking only at the left side. Uh, one sided limits are a whole lot easier to do if you are looking at a graph. So let's look at a few examples real quick with a graph. Um, and let's see, let's see, let's see. So here's my function f of x. Let's say I want to approach 0, and that little negative means from the left side only. So here's 0. This is when x equals 0. And I don't care at all what's happening over here. All of this is irrelevant. That means absolutely nothing to this graph, to this limit, because I'm looking only from the left side. And as I follow the left side, this graph is coming down here to a y-coordinate of negative 1. So the left side's approaching negative 1. Now I've got to erase all this crap. What am I thinking? There we go. Uh, number 2, still approaching 0. We're still looking at 0, so I'll put that back there. Still looking at x equals 0, except now I'm looking from the right. A little plus sign means only come from the right. So if I look at the right side, coming from the right, my graph is coming in at a y-coordinate of negative 2. Number 3, uh, x is approaching 2 from the left. Well, now I'm going to move over. I'm going to approach 2. I'm going to be a little bit more artisty with this. Let's go with a dotted line here. So here I'm approaching 2. And remember, with limits, it doesn't matter what's actually happening at the number. Like at 2, we have some crazy stuff. We have two open circles and a, a random point, uh, but that's not going to affect the limit, because limit cares what's happening just around two, and this time I'm coming from the left, so the left side of two, the left side is coming up here at a y-coordinate of two. The right side of two, coming down here, and that's coming in at a y-coordinate of zero. Um, now number five says the limit as you approach two, nothing's written there, so that means we have to look at both sides. We've actually already done that. We did that in 3 and 4. And since 3 and 4 had different answers, left side was going to 2, right side was going to 0. That means this limit does not exist. Um, number 6, limit as you approach 3. So let me move my little vertical line over to 3. And let's see, coming from the right side only. So the right side of 3 is coming in, looks like at a y coordinate of 1. So there's how you do one-sided limits with a graph. It's not too bad. Um, where it gets a little bit tricky is when you are doing one-sided limits with an equation. Um, most of the time, you're going to be able to treat it as if that isn't even there. If you have an equation, first thing I'm going to try is just to solve the limit. I'm just going to try plugging in. So let's see. If I plug in 8, 1 over 8 plus 8, that's 16. Hey, what do you know? I didn't have to do any real work. Uh, a one-sided limit, if you can just plug in, just plug in. And it solves the exact same way as uh, a normal two-sided limit. Here I am, x is approaching 3 from the left. Um, well, since I have an equation, I'm going to try plugging in first. 3 squared minus 9 is 0. 3 squared is 9. 2 times 3 is 6. So that would be 15 minus 15 is 0. Okay, this is one where... I'm going to need to factor. So let's factor here. x squared minus 9 factors x plus 3, x minus 3. x squared, that one factors to x plus 5x minus 3. My x minus 3's cancel. And then I can plug in 3. 3 plus 3 is 6. 3 plus 5 is 8. And that reduces to 3 fourths. So if it's a one-sided limit with an equation, you can actually just treat it as if uh, it's a normal limit and you can ignore the left side. Uh, 
there are a few occasions where you get some goofy answers and you'll have to consider what side we're approaching from. And number three here is an example of one of those. If I try plugging in two, the absolute value of two minus two is zero. Um, and then two minus two is also zero. And if you get zero over zero, I've told you you need to factor. The problem with absolute values is you can't really factor it. And do not cancel. They're not the exact same thing. So you can't just cancel x minus two and x minus two and say the answer is one. I wish you could, but it doesn't work that way. Uh, so the way we're going to approach absolute value problems almost every time, almost every time, I, I hesitate to say every time because there may be a lo oh, an exception, but if we have an absolute value problem in calculus, we're going to treat it like a piecewise function. We're going to convert our absolute value into a piecewise function. And I like to think, uh, to think. I like to graph. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to isolate just the absolute value part of this equation. Because x minus 2 doesn't bother me. It's the absolute value. So let's graph the absolute value of x minus 2, which is pretty easy. It's a basic transformation. Your absolute value of x shifted to the right two units. So I'm going to graph it. It's going to come down. Its absolute value shifted right. So it's going to come down like this and then it's going to bounce back up. So there is my absolute value graph shifted to the right two places. And what I will do is I'm going to treat that as two completely separate equations. On the left side of two, I'm going to find the equation for this piece. And this is slope-intercept form. So this piece on the left side right here, I'll draw my arrow right there, that left side equation, that's a slope of negative 1. So it's going to be y equals negative 1x or just negative x. And my y-intercept is 2. If you don't believe me, plug in 2. 2 minus 2. Wait. Plug in 0. If I plug in 0, 0 minus 2, um, an absolute value of that is 2. So the left side of my equation is negative x plus 2. <coughs> the right side, that's a slope of positive 1, so y equals x. The y-intercept what we have to do is continue this graph until it would hit the y-axis, and that would hit at negative 2. If we followed that slope of negative 1, my y-intercept for the right side is negative 2. So what I do with my absolute value graph, I have the absolute value of x minus 2, and I'm going to split that into a piecewise function. Um, <clears throat> I have one equation of negative x plus 2, and that equation only applies when x is less than 2. And the other equation, x minus 2, that's the right side of my graph. That applies when x is greater than 2. Um, now, y'all may be wondering, what about when x equals 2? If you wanted to be, uh, you could really put that equals on either one of them. But in the back of my mind, I know we're dealing with the limit. And with limits, I don't care what happens at 2. I care what's happening either to the left or to the right. And I have to the left and to the right. So I'm not going to worry about what's happening at 2. Um, and, but what I will do is I'm going to go back to my limit. And I notice I'm coming from the left side. So if I look at my piecewise function, the left side of 2 is this line. And that was represented by the equation negative x plus 2. The left side of 2 is negative x plus 2. So what I'm going to do is remove the absolute value and substitute in its place the equation of the absolute value graph on the left side of 2. So I have negative x plus 2 over x minus 2. And now I'm going to retry the limit. Um, I know I can't plug in 0, I still, or 2. I still get 0 over 0. Um, but what I can do in the numerator is factor out a negative 1, which gives me x minus 2, my denominator x minus 2, and those will cancel, leaving me with only a negative 1, which is actually going to be the answer to the limit, because there's nowhere to plug in the 2. So this limit, as I come from the left side of 2, that, at that whole function is approaching negative 1. Uh, and that's unfortunately how we're going to have to do piecewise functions. We're going to graph it, or put it in a piecewise function, however you're capable of doing that, and then we will do the algebra with whichever side we need to look at. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see. How are we? Nine minutes. Not too bad. Not too bad. Okay, so there's a one-sided limit with absolute value. That's rare. Most of the time, the one-sided limits, you're going to be able to treat it like a normal limit 
or you're going to be looking at a graph, which is a lot easier. But you do need to know how to handle absolute values because it will show up on occasion. Um, moving on to continuity. Uh, now, you know there are three types of discontinuities. You have jumps, asymptotes, and holes. Hopefully you know that. Um, the way we're going to prove continuity in calculus, we're not going to abandon all that jumps, asymptotes, and holes stuff, but this is the calculus definition of continuity. The limit as x approaches some number is equal to f of that number. Uh, let's think about that graphically. Um, let me draw some graph. I wanted that to be black. Come on, work with me here. There we go. Okay, if a limit exists, so I'm approaching c, I'm just going to pick some random c. If a limit does exist, that means that the left side of c has to approach the same thing as the right side. Now, I could have a hole there. So simply having a limit that exists does not mean you're continuous. So in order for something to be continuous, first, the limit must exist. So I've got a, a, an existing limit at C. But in order to prevent the possibility of a hole, we actually have to fill it in. And so the way we fill it in is we actually make sure that the function's value is the same thing as the limit. So if the limit as you approach C is the same thing as F of C, then what you have is a continuous function. Um, a few examples to determine whether or not a function is continuous. First thing I'm going to do is find F of the C value. In this case, it's not. Um, because if, you're, if your function does not exist, at that number, then you're automatically discontinuous. And for number one here, if I plug in 9, 9 plus 3 is 12, 9 minus 9 is 0, ah, 12 divided by 0 is undefined. So since my function does not exist at 9, I don't have to worry about the limit. Uh, this thing all is automatically discontinuous, or not continuous, however you want to write it. So since my function does not exist at 9, I don't have to worry about the limit. So always find the function value first, because that's usually the easier part. And if you get a number for the function, if you get some value, then you could go on and, um, and try the limit. So this one, f of 9 didn't exist, so I don't care about the limit as you approach 9. Let's try this one. Uh, the piecewise functions are usually the ones where you're going to have to worry about uh, the, the limit definition, the whole limit thing. So. Uh, if I want this thing to be continuous at 2, that means I want the limit as x approaches 2 of my function to equal f of 2. Uh, and I'm going to start by finding f of 2. So f of 2, I'll do this over here. f of 2 is, let's see, f of 2, that's not, here's when x is equal to 2. f of 2 is 2 plus 5 is 7. So I'm going to hold on to that, and what I'm going to hope is that my limit also equals 7, because that's going to make this thing continuous. And what you have to remember for limits is you have to approach from both sides. And this time, I don't have just one function. So if I want to know if the limit exists, I'm actually going to have to look at the left and right side separately. So let's do the limit as x approaches 2 from the left side of f of x. And the left side of 2 is defined by x plus 5. And if I plug in 2 to that, I get 7. So the left side is approaching 7. The right side, limit as x approaches 2 from the right of f of x. Well, the right side is defined by x squared plus 3. That's when x is greater than 2. That's the right side. 2 squared is 4 plus 3 is 7. Ah, right, good. So I'm looking at this, and I see that left and right side is the same. That means that the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x is equal to 7. And since the limit and f of 2 were the same, that is equal to f of 2. Therefore, I can say f is continuous at x is equal to 7. Uh, I'm sorry, x equals 2. Um, so if the limit equals the function's value, then you are continuous. And you have to do it this way. On the AP exam, if they ask you to show that something is continuous, you have to go through and prove that the limit is equal to f of whatever. You can't simply just kind of say, oh, well, there's no holes or there's no asymptote. You have to go through and actually prove that the limit is equal to f of 2. 
Uh, let's do one more. How, how are we doing here? About 15 minutes. All right, so last one. Last one. Uh, same thing. Uh, it's uh, a piecewise function, and I want to know what's happening at 1, which means I need to show that the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is equal to f of 1. That's my game plan. Uh, let's start with f of 1. f of 1 is f of 1 is, well, that's less than 1, that's greater than 1. Here's when x equals 1, and when x equals 1, my function is at 0. Yeah, yeah? Uh, so there's f of 1. Now I've got to find the limit as x approaches 1, and with a piecewise function, since my transition happens at 1, I've got to look at left and right sides separately. Do not get confused with this. A lot of people want to say the limit is equal to 0, but that's what's happening at 1. If you remember with limits, Limits don't care what's happening at the x value. It cares what's happening left and right. So don't let this middle piece confuse you with the limit. It's completely irrelevant as far as the limit's concerned. So x is approaching 1 from the left of f of x. The left side of 1 is 1 squared minus 3. 1 squared, or I'm sorry, it's x squared minus 3. If you plug in 1 to that, you get negative 2. Um, which that right there is enough for me to know my function's not continuous because my left side is not approaching zero. So I could go ahead and stop and say my function's discontinuous, but I'm going to kill this debt. I'm going to go all the way through this and do the limit as I approach one from the right. Let's see. The right side of one is 5x minus 7. If I plug in one, you get negative 2. And based on that, I can say that the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is negative 2, which is not equal to f of 1. And that means we're discontinuous. This function is not continuous. f is not continuous at x equals 1. Uh, now, I'm going to go one step further. Since it's not continuous, let's find out what kind of discontinuity this is. And to do that, Let's see, I'll scroll down a little bit. We need this information right here. And I'm going to sketch this graph real quick. I'm concerned with what's happening at 1. So here's 1. I know that f of 1 is 0. So I have a point at 0. And real quick, I'm just going to look at the left and the right. The left and the right side of this graph. Let's see, I want to move this up. The left and the right side of this graph are both going to the same place, but they're going to negative 2. So here's negative 2. The left side's coming down here. The right side's coming down here. And I'm going to have an open circle. And what we actually have here is a removable discontinuity. It's a removable discontinuity. Uh, and we'll talk about more about identifying the actual types of discontinuities in class. So there we go. That's one-sided limits and continuity. We'll polish this up in class on Friday.